past few years, uh, we, we normally go through books of the Bible here at Mount Sinai Community Church. We really do. Uh, we're in the book of Luke. We're not quite halfway done. We'll be through the book of Luke for the rest of the year. But I take one-offs. So we'll take uh, certain Sundays off to talk about a topic that I think is extremely important. And today is one of those. I do these once a year. Um, I mentioned this morning, uh, this, this is the sermon I'm doing. And I won't say who, but the amen that came from the front row was like, oh, really, that one? Okay, I, I guess I'll come. So <laughs> strap in. It's going to be a good one. So I have a concern as it concerns the, the Christian life, and um, here's my concern. We live in a day and age now where we have access to, like, every single possible good speaker, podcast, training, YouTube. I mean, honestly, if, if I was being brutally honest, don't come to church here. Go listen to a much better speaker from your home. Uh, hang out, put them on the big screen, and learn better theology than I'm going to teach you. The problem is we live in a day and age now in American evangelicalism where people have the, we have the top notch. I mean, you know, I got, I got Bible, I got everything here to learn the Christian life. If I just want information, I literally have it all here. Um, and my fear is that, so we, we learn a bunch of stuff, and we're in a day and age that's the best for that. So that would mean to me that I live in a day and age where evangelicals in America should be the godliest generation since Jesus. And that is not true. We have real problems in the church. In fact, I'll, I wrote it down this way. American evangelicals are often miserable people who are half-hearted about their faith and lack so many qualities that Jesus emphasized. That's the truth. We can fool ourselves and say that we're better than we are, but we really aren't. And so my fear is that maybe we're getting some head knowledge, but it's not connecting with my heart, and that it's not connecting in my everyday life in the way that I do life. And so um, I'm amazed at how many people hate this book and have never read it. I'm amazed at how many people say they love this book and have never read it. I'm amazed at our lack of biblical understanding, our lack of theology, our lack of teaching, and I actually cannot blame the average church attender. Who I should probably be blaming is the religious leaders of our day. Um, that's who Jesus went after, by the way. So if you really wanted to be like Jesus, regular sinners who are just living their life, lots of grace and love. Religious leaders who aren't being faithful to God's word, lots of condemnation. And so I don't like to point at other people here at Mountainside. I like to point at ourselves and try to figure out how we can do something better. And so this morning, I want to talk about the critical piece of your life that you, if I was, typically if I ask people, how is your quiet time? How's your devotional life? How's your time with God? How's your Bible reading? How's your study? How's your prayer life? Those kinds of things. Typically when I ask someone that, they'll give themselves a solid C minus. They're probably lying. It's probably a solid D minus. But the fact of the matter is, is that we say we have God's word, but we're not actually in it. We say we serve an omniscient, omnipresent, all-powerful, all-everything God who can do anything radical in my life, and I rarely talk with him. And so this morning, I'm going to play this out. If you ever see a chair, um, some, kind, some kind soul today said, is your back that bad? So... A person who actually cares about me, you know, I'm waiting for the day when I just sit down and I'm like, good morning, guys. <laughs> and so if you ever see the, the chair up here, it means this is the sermon that's coming. What I want to do is play out a quiet time because I get a lot of people who are like, hey, church is awesome. What next? I'm like, start having a quiet time with God. I don't, I don't know. Deer in the headlights. By the way, big book, small print. Lots here to go through. Where do I start? What do I do? How do I do this? I don't understand. So I want to talk about that. I'm going to give you some very specific points today. If you like writing points down, today's your day. So the first thing I want to do is give you three reasons why you should actually have a quiet time. Number one, Jesus did it. Jesus had a quiet time with the Father, and he often chose solitude over the noise of the crowd. 
Jesus had a quiet time before a major task, to recharge after a hard day's work, to work through his grief before making an important decision, during moments of distress, and to focus on prayer. So you, all of you have some level of relationships, even if you don't have a spouse, you have a loved one, you have a friend, you have someone who you want a relationship with. And uh, rarely do I, you know, I, I think it's hilarious if someone comes to me and says, I have a bad relationship with my spouse. Okay, all right, that's okay. You have a bad relationship with your spouse. What do we do? Well, I'll, I don't know. I don't want to spend any time with them. I just want a really good relationship. I want a connection, but I don't actually want to spend any time with the person. Well, that's what people do with God. So they say, God, I feel disconnected from you. I don't know where you're at. Are you speaking to me? Do you love me? Are you there for me? but we don't spend any time connecting with the Father. So it is, to me, it is the height of my pride that tells me that a daily devotional or quiet time was okay for Jesus, but I don't need it. That would seem a little bit off to me, that somehow Jesus needed something that I don't. Second, God commands it. The Father wants a relationship with you. He wants uninterrupted time with you. Just like any good relationship, he wants to spend time with you. James 4.8, draw near to God and he will what? Draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you're double-minded. A quiet time with God removes the distractions and allows us to focus on God. I often ask God, where are you? Are you drawing near to me? And James 4.8 says, I need to draw near to him. Matthew 4.4, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. These are the words of God. How am I going to live by every word that comes from God if I don't know the word of God? It's not going to happen. Romans 12, 2, do not be conformed to this present world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. A quiet time, if you wanted to think about it, not only is it a quiet time, a time to connect with the Father, it's a time to connect with yourself too. We're going to talk about that here in a moment. And third, we need it. A quiet time is good for us and builds our relationship with God. I don't know if you know this, there's a big theological world word called sanctification. You are supposed to be sanctified. In other words, from the moment of salvation, you're still a wretched sinner in your flesh. I wish when we got saved, all the flesh went away and we were just all doing great. And that's just not the way it is. There's a lifetime of work whereby God prunes us, works on us, sanctifies us, makes us holy. 1 Peter 1, 6 says, you shall be holy for I am holy. My old pastor used to say, you know, there's two ways. Um, he used to take his dog and his cat to, uh, on, a, on a trip. The dog gets to sit in the front seat and be happy. The cat gets thrown in a box, screams the whole way. But they're both going to the same location. You need to be a part of this process because God's going to work in and through you. And he's going to use his word. One man said it this way. Many are looking for a special word from God while it sits on their shelves gathering dust. I mean, that is true. And so every, every year I give this sermon, I, I really give it to myself too. Like, I've got to have a better quiet time. I've got to be in the word more. I've got to make this a priority. I, I need to be doing, doing, doing. And it's not so much doing, it's more building. Building a better relationship with the Father. So I wanted to do this uh, today. And now I'm going to change this up. Uh, I'll try to, let's try to adjust this. So what I want to do, I play, I play act this um, once a year, and you get a different kind of a sermon. So I'm going to walk you through my quiet time. So um, do you ever, you ever heard the phrase like, um, do you know how to get better at praying? Anybody? Yeah, good. Pray. You also get better at praying by being around people who are really good at praying. So both. Um, so you need to be praying more, and you need to get, and by the way, uh, anybody heard Dave Pastorell pray? Yeah, try being around him a bunch. It would be good for your soul. So what I wanted to do was give you my seven, 
These are my big seven. If you want to have a quiet time, you're going to do these seven. I, I don't have any other way around it. Um, I'm also going to give you a bunch of resources. These are the things I'm reading. You don't have to read Institutes by Calvin um, yet. Um, these are my top. These are other options. These are things that I do. I also have a Bible reading chart. I sent this out at the beginning of the year to everybody. This is a custom. I've never seen one. You can customize it. So I read through the Old Testament once a year, and then I read through the New Testament like three or four times a year. Um, pretty easy to do. It doesn't take a lot, but it's a customizable plan I'll give to you. Um, and so here's, here's my bottom. This is, this is my bottom line, my seven best. If you don't do these things, you're not going to have a good quiet time. Number one, you need to believe that this actually matters. I cannot give you that. I cannot give you that the God of the universe wants to connect with you. He really does. Um, anybody ever join a gym? Anybody ever not use the gym that you joined? Like, these are hard things, right? I hope everybody in this room has experienced being great at something. I really do. I hope you put time into something and you accomplished something that you're like, I never thought I could do that thing. I didn't think I could conquer that mountain. But it didn't come from you sitting on the couch all day long. It came from you getting up and doing something great and striving and moving forward. And you, did, you probably did something in your life. You're like, I'm kind of proud of myself. That was really cool. Like, I worked really hard, and God blessed me and allowed me to do something. A quiet time is no different. You need to believe that this actually matters. If you want a better marriage, you're going to have to work on it. I don't know any other way to say it. And as soon as I say that, my biggest fear is that every spouse just went, just now thought, yeah, he better. <laughs> or, yeah, she ain't trying very hard. Like, I'm not... For the next 30 minutes or 20 minutes, I'm not talking about anybody but you, just you. And I'm going to emphasize here in a moment. So one, you need to believe that this matters. Two, you need to choose a time and a place. So let me walk you through my morning. My morning is garbage. It's something, if you told me 10 years ago that this would be my morning, I would tell you that I would hate it more than anything ever. I married one of the greatest, strongest women I've ever met in my entire life. And she is a worker, and she is very, very strong. Unfortunately, she loves mornings. And I do not. Oh, I want to make sure I grab this. Um, she loves morning time. And so if you told me I was going to have to become a morning person, I would have said, no, that, that ain't possible. And it's actually been a huge benefit for me to become more of a morning person. Um, so in the morning... Um, my dogs are laying on top of me by six, licking, licking, making noise. My wife is up. She's moving along. And so I kind of need to be up by six. So I'm up at six. Some of you are like, wow, that's, you get to sleep in. And some of you are like, that sounds like a migraine headache. So I'm up at six and I get, um, like now it's warm. So sweatpants, sweatshirt, whatever. And I go hang. So I tell Allison, I'm going to go hang. And she's like, hang with who? No, I literally have a machine I hang upside down on because my back hurts so bad. And so I literally hang in the morning, and then I stretch. So that's like 20 minutes. By then, the earth is getting a little warmer, but not really. So then I get to go grab Penny and Diesel, our Springer Spaniels, and I take them on about a 30-minute walk. So every morning in the dark now, I'm walking with my Springers. And what that has allowed me to do is pray. I'm begging all of you, even if you don't start at a quiet time, I am begging you to start a prayer life of some kind. Get away. Go on a walk. Do something where you can just talk with God. So I'll talk with the Springers. I'll run ideas by them. And I'll run ideas by God. And after that, I shower, get ready, and I'm... I'm off. So by 7, I'm out. Um, one time I was at the home at like 7.20, and my wife came up to me and said, hey, are you leaving anytime soon? <laughs> and I'm like, well, I mean, this is my home, but, um, she, well, you're kind of a distraction. I'm, so she works from home, so she's on Zoom calls and all that kind of stuff, so it's going. So I'm out. So that has forced me, I say this in a good way, it's forced me to move along. 
I'm at this office upstairs by about 7.15. And in my office, I put my phone away. I'll put some music on and I will start my study. So it's in my office that I can sit. I will always go to God's word first. So that's what I do. Whatever reading plan, I want God's word over men's words. Even those men's words can be very encouraging. And so, um, well, I'm skipping. So that's the choose the time and place. Choose for you. I don't care what it is, but choose. Choose something and stick to it. So for me, morning. By the time, about 7.15, I'm here at the office. Turn off the noise. Get rid of your cell phone. For, I mean, this is, I, I got to tell you, we spend, here's the scary part about life today. My fear is that this is feeding me a lot more than God's word, like a lot more. And so put this aside, turn off the noise. If you have kids, if you're a young mom or something, that's hard. I realize that that's all hard. This is not easy for everybody. For some of you, this is really easy to turn off the noise. For others of you, this is going to take some, some planning and some preparation. And then I want to open in prayer. So we have prayer mugs here. Uh, please grab a prayer mug on your way out if you don't have a prayer mug. I know it has our, our logo and Jesus changes everything, but this prayer mug's not about us. Please pray for myself, the staff, the elders. Pray for the church. Pray for one another. Pray for people who need Jesus. Pray for your own needs. Cast your cares upon him because what? He cares for you. He really does. But so many of you are so busy battling your own burdens and shoving things down and fighting, you're not casting your cares on God and letting him worry about your future. Today has enough what? Worries of its own. Stop allowing the past to destroy your present and stop worrying about the future, which also destroys your present. Live in the present. One of the best ways to live in the present, grab a mug, fill it with coffee, and open in prayer. So I'll pray. I'll pray something like um, maybe the Lord's Prayer. We went through the Lord's Prayer. You can always go online. You can learn. There's uh, I have a four-part prayer. Um, I do sign of the cross. I'll do um, up, down, in, out. Uh, I'll pray the Lord's Prayer. So I focus on God first. Then I'll focus on his kingdom. Then I'll focus on some of my own stuff and my outward ability to serve the Lord. Whatever prayer, start in prayer. Next, you need to read. The average, what was the stat I read? The average American male after high school reads like two books in his lifetime. I'm not condemning that. I think it's hilarious and totally awesome. So if, you're, if you don't like reading, guess what? Nowhere in the Bible does it say if you don't like reading, you're screwed. Can't be a Christian. Can't get much Jesus in you. You're off the deep end and God doesn't love you anymore. Um, if some of you have big commutes, download, what do I have? I was just giving a Bible to somebody. U version. You can download uh, U version on your phone. This will just Bluetooth to your car and listen to the Bible. It's better to listen to the radio. Radio's garbage. Radio's a bunch of advertising on how to get a um, uh, how to borrow more money for a car that you can't actually afford. That's what the radio is. So you might as well be listening to God's word. Listen to God's word. Don't read um, these devotionals that I have here on top. This is this is my personal favorite because it's my new community group. If you're in the best community group here at Mountainside, then um, this is the book we're going through. I'm joking. Uh, Dave's in Hawaii, so I can say those things. Um, if you want really good devotionals, um, Paul Tripp, New, uh, New Morning Mercies, one of the best I've ever read. You can literally order these on Amazon and get them to your home tomorrow for just a few dollars. Certainly, uh, what's this? I'm probably holding my hand three Starbucks coffees. I like to pick on Starbucks because it's expensive. You're holding three Starbucks coffees. You might as well get one of these. Um, but you need to read. You need to fill your mind with God's word. You need to begin to take in. Read the Gospels. It doesn't, I don't care right now what you're reading. If you're reading a, a plan, wonderful. But you need to be taking in God's word so that you can adjust your thinking. It is extremely ignorant for each of us to, st to sit in this room and think that we are right about everything. That's not possible. Every one of us in this room is really wrong about at least one thing. 
And I trust God and his power through the power of the Holy Spirit in your life to speak through his word and to help you find out where you might be missing something. So read. Next, this is the key. You're going to have to have some level of meditation for application. You can sit in these sermons. You can take notes. You go home. By the time you fought with your spouse, screamed at a kid, gotten home and you're hungry, Sunday morning's gone. It doesn't even exist anymore. It's like, it's like you were never here. So at some point in your daily devotional life, you're going to need to take some time and say, Father, what do you want from me? So let me encourage you in this way. Um, I fear that we've become professionals at playing the victim role and blaming others for our problems. So let me just say this during this part. You are going to stay miserable, bitter, angry, resentful, upset, and less of a human being than I know that you can be as long as you continue to blame others for your problems. It's in this meditation for application where I really have to focus and say, Father, I'm really upset maybe at somebody. Or maybe I was hurt, and it's okay to be hurt. But during my time with God, it's only about me. Like, what is God asking of me to do? Listen, I don't know that any of us can change another human being. I can't. I tried. I, I give up. I tried. I tried to change other human beings. I am unable to change those human beings. I can't do it. I'll tell you what's hard enough. It's hard enough to change my own life. And I've got power over that. So when you're having these discussions with God, when you're having these quiet times, don't your, uh, uh, I'm going to go so far as a satanic or demonic or otherworldly or evil or bad takeaway after any devotional life is, I can't wait to share this with my wife. She needs to hear this. No, she doesn't. The Holy Spirit's powerful enough to speak to your wife. You do not, you're not learning your quiet time so that you can go preach to people. Your quiet time is to preach to you. You've got to trust me on this. You have got to own your own sin. And there is never going to be a better time than you talking to the safest person in the universe, which is your father in heaven who sent his son to die for you. That's how much he loves you. He loves you so much that he would send his son to be crucified to win you back. His love is so deep for you that you can faithfully and carefully and trustingly talk to the Father about the things that you're going through. But you've got to do it. The hardest reality I had to face over the last maybe two years is my own sin. I say that really, I'm, a, I'm ashamed of it. But it's like facing God and saying, but, I had to stop, but them, but that. But you don't understand, Father, that person. However that person treats or acts, it doesn't matter. The last time I checked, Jesus was spit on, hit, mocked, and while he was dying, he says the words, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. I'm a hypocrite for saying I want to walk like Jesus, but I want to hold the sins of others against them. That's hypocrisy. I have a word. I have two older boys that we talk about this stuff with. We have a saying amongst ourselves that I can't say from the pulpit. But they know what I'm talking about. So I had to sit with the Father and read a stack of books way higher than this to finally get to the point where I'm like, my heart hurts. I'm mad, I'm bitter, I'm angry. And I don't want to be a pastor anymore either. So I went golfing for like three months. I don't want to do this. Why am I doing this? Why am I doing life? Why do I keep striving? 
Why am I fighting with people? I'm giving you an example of the inner turmoil that needs to happen during a quiet time. This is what I'm talking about. I'm talking about hard work. I'm not talking about read your quiet time. Thank you, Lord. I am awesome. Amen. Move about my day. That's what the Pharisees do. We're not Pharisees. I'm talking about heart, soul kind of heart level work, and it takes you to be honest with God. My mic's here. And God already knows what you're doing. Like, we're, we're hiding this from God? Like, hey, God, I think I'm good today. He's like, no, you're actually not. You're a wreck and a half. But I love you, and I can work on you. But I can also hear God saying, but you give me no time, Dawson. You just get up. You run to your to-do. You're late. You run to a meeting. You meeting, meeting, meeting. You counseled that person really good. You told them what they should be doing, but you don't care what I'm telling you to do. You get home, you make dinner, you're with your family, and then chill. Or when it's light, go hit some balls. You don't give me any time. You don't give me any time to talk to your heart, to talk to your soul. You don't give me any time. You do not draw near to me, and that's why you feel like I'm not near to you. This is critically important. You have got to have a level of meditation for application. So a byproduct of this should be real change. In six months, people who love you and know you should say, I see change in you. I know that you're working on this thing and I appreciate it and I think you're getting better at that thing. If you don't have that, I don't know what you have. You have a Christian mind who believes a bunch of stuff and doesn't do anything? That's not a Christian. A Christian is someone who dies to self and dies to the world and lives for Jesus. That's what a Christian does. Not perfectly. And the greatest thing during this time is you've got the God of the universe who you can trust and you can talk to him. I always close in prayer. I'll get my mug. I'll have, uh, I have a coffee warmer. So I put on the coffee warmer. I can't stand cold coffee. So I take it up and it's always warm and I can drink my coffee and I can pray. And in your prayer, your closing prayer, um, you could say something to the effect of, I recognize my sin. I blame nobody for my mistakes. I am not a victim. I am loved by God. I am adopted as his child. Nothing I can do can unearn my salvation. And at the same time, my father loves me so much, I want to follow him. Listen, it, the Bible never says, it's the great big lectures of God that brings us to repentance. The Bible says it's the love of God. It's the kindness of God. Like God is so kind and he's so gracious and he's so loving to you that it's like you want to turn and you like kick a puppy. Like God's like, don't kick me, I love you. I gave my life for you. I'm asking you, now that I've done everything for you, follow me. Work on your stuff. But you can all picture, maybe it's just me, maybe it's not you, going the next 365 days, and I never even take enough time to have these conversations with God. Ever. I just move, I just move so fast that I never stop. And so some of you who are really doers like me, you have to call a timeout. Uh, so I call timeouts now. Uh, when more of my kids were in the home, I started a thing where I call a timeout for myself. So I leave the home. I go in the garage. I sit down on a uh, uh, chair, and I talk to God out loud. 
God, I can't handle this. I'm not enjoying my life right now. I fully admit that I'm probably in sin, even though I want to admit that it's mostly my wife and my children's faults. And then it goes from there. And I'm just talking to God. If I say he's big, then he, he's here for me. He listens to me. We want to minimize God. We want to make him small. When the fact of the matter is, God is everywhere all at the same time, and he's 100% present with you. He's just right there with you, listening to you, hearing you, helping you. It's normally in a closing prayer that I start to stray a little bit, and I want to blame. I want to blame shift. I want to victimize. I want to do those things. And at the end, I have to just say, and Father, um, help me to listen to Jesus. I think it's Jesus in the end of one of the Gospels. Who was it? Peter comes up to Jesus. I mentioned this a few weeks ago. Peter comes up to Jesus and goes, blah, 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 I would die for you. And Jesus is like, yeah, you're going to die for me. And Jesus tells John he's going to do okay. And then Peter goes, what about that guy? And Jesus says, that's his business. You go about your business. So in my closing prayer, I'll say, Father, help me with my business. I don't need to be up in your business. I don't need to be up in my kid's business. I certainly don't need to be up in my wife's business. I need to be about my business. And I will tell you this. You do this every day. You start a process. You will become a powerful force, and you will see the change in your family and friends that you wanted when you were yelling at them. Just do it here. Make the change in your own heart first, and that change will begin to spread, and it will catch on. I'm asking a big thing from you, but I'm telling you that it will be worth it. I promise you this. And you're going to be able to have some heart change in your life that you've never seen before. As the worship team comes forward, let me just pray. Father God, I do thank you for each soul who's here. Father, you love them immensely. You are here for them. You are ready to be a good and loving Heavenly Father. And the problem with that is, Father, sometimes we have fathers here on earth who weren't there for us, who failed us. And it's hard to trust. But you prove that we can trust you by your son dying on a cross for us. Our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Every other religious fraud comes to us and tells us what we need to do in order to find God. And Jesus, God, becomes flesh. And he says, I'm here for you. I'm here to create a way for you. I'm here to do the heavy lifting. You don't actually have to do the heavy lifting. In fact, when we come to Jesus and we walk away from him after finding Christ, Jesus turns and says, hey, my yoke is light. Father, for all those who have experienced the world, loved the world, been in the world, taken in the world, ingested the world, filled their minds with the world, I pray that the end result of that is a yoke that is really, really heavy and it hurts. And they can drop that weight at the foot of the cross. Because their Lord and their Savior, Jesus Christ, is not asking anything of them. Thank you for today. I want to pray for each person that they would begin to have a quiet time that is more beneficial to their Christian life. And we do this not to earn salvation. Salvation is a free gift by grace through faith through the narrow door, Jesus Christ himself. But so that ultimately, we can live a better life. We can drop the victimhood, the burden, the anger, the bitterness, the resentment, the hate. Drop it. And we can live a life that is so free. Thank you, Jesus, for accomplishing all of that. And now we're here to worship you praise you, love you, come to you. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.